This is House Planning Help, episode 90. Hello, I'm Ben Adam Smith, and this is the podcast for you if you want to build a new house or upgrade an existing property. I'm exploring what houses we should be building in the 21st century. My personal goal is to create an energy-efficient home before I turn 40 in August 2016. Coming up in this session, my guest is Darren Macri from Blue Nest, and we're going to be talking about whether you need Passive House certified tradespeople if you're building a Passive House. I hope you're well. This is always a really busy time of year for me because not only are the UK Passive House Awards round again, that means a road trip and getting lots of footage and editing and doing this all in a tight time frame, but Regen Media has picked up some more clients. We've got all that to juggle and we're trying to develop house planning help so that it has not only a makeover, but a new aspect to it. This is the hub, the membership area that we're going to offer even more value. And we've been conducting quite a lot of research. Perhaps you're someone listening at the moment who's contributed to that so we think we have a fair idea of what you want and what you'll pay for and so that's what we're trying to produce but it is a lot of work then on top of that i thought i would let you know about this new address here houseplanninghelp.com slash events because we will change what's on that page according to what's coming up we had our documentary the future of housing a little while ago and I've been when I had the opportunity taking it around and showing it to people there's a debate that goes along with that and at this particular one that's coming up which will obviously be time specific but the next one is in Hereford which is a very passive house friendly area of the UK and Archetype I'm a big fan of them as architects overall just because I think they really go the extra mile and I'm looking forward to checking out this building but if you come along to our event that's something you can do as well so find out more information and and just come along. It'd be lovely to meet you. Houseplanninghelp.com slash events. Today's interview is with Darren Macri from Blue Nest, although I would argue Blur Nest, because that's how he that's how he's written it, his company name. Blur as in French meaning blue. And I should have asked this in the interview. I didn't. However, I have done since, and Darren has emailed back. So I thought it's worth putting in. He says it comes from the two biggest trouble areas in the built environment, energy consumption and comfort. When you take a thermal image of a high performance home, such as a passive house, the walls do not show any heat loss and they read blue. If we woke up tomorrow morning and read in the paper, global warming solved and everyone is allowed to use all the energy they wanted for free, we would still build passive house because of the comfort and what evokes the image of comfort more than a nest that surrounds you and supports you. I see where this is coming from. And as for the spelling, we spelt bleu the French way just to add a little bit of class to the joint. <laughs> You're going to find out Darren's a great guy. We'll speak to him right now. In our chat, I suppose the focus of this is really about hiring architects, builders, tradespeople who all have the official passive house training. Is it worth it just going to get these people or can we have any old builder? So we'll be discussing that. Also taking a look at Darren's own build that's underway at the moment. And I saw an opportunity to answer a voicemail question from Alex in Ireland. All of that in our interview. So we'll get cracking. I started by asking Darren how he came to work in environmental construction. Well, I took a quite unconventional route to becoming a, uh, a high-performance builder. My background is actually in film and photography. I went to NYU's uh, film school and graduated and was working in that field for some time. And then my father, who was doing some development in uh, Hoboken, New Jersey, he and his building partner... They they had parted ways, and my father was left with a project, and he had said, you know, uh, I have this project. I have to get it done. And I I was kind of doing commercial photography at the time. It wasn't uh, of that much interest to me anymore. And so I gave it a whirl, and I just loved the process. I loved seeing the building come up. It was a brand-new construction, and so then I got more and more involved that was in the early 2000s, and I really, I really loved it, and, and I felt it was actually more creative than what I'd been doing. And so I said, okay, well, if I want to keep doing this, I have to do it in a way that speaks to uh, my sensibility. And I became uh, a LEED certified. LEED had a, a lot of nice things to it, but it didn't really bite down into the dramatic change that I think we need to make in the present and in the immediate future. And it was through a conference here 
in 2009 in New York City that I discovered Passive House. And it was like, holy smokes, where have you been all my life, you know? And I wrote it all down in a notebook, and then I let it sit on my desk for a year. And <laughs> <laughs> Like all these things. That's an amazing story, though. I like certain aspects. When you moved from your film and photography into this, were you drawn to a particular area or did it take some time to hone in and decide, I want to be the builder? Well, no, what happened was we had hired a builder to build this project in Hoboken and he quickly proved to us that he wasn't up for the task. And I just jumped in and really didn't know what the heck I was doing and learned on the job. And so I pretty much made a commitment to uh, sustainable building early on. And it's really the only way I I know how to build. And I think this is probably the hardest thing in my field is that uh, a lot of folks are committed to ways that they've been doing things. And it's hard for them financially time-wise, risk-wise, to retool themselves educationally and physically to building in a more uh, sustainable manner. Are you able then to make sure that you pick only Passive House projects? Are you at that level now? I'm trying to make that that 100% commitment to Passive House. I think no matter what project I do, one person is the person, oh, it's a standard, it's a label, I want that. And that energizes them. The other folks are like, well, that sounds great. I love the idea of that. But that's really for somebody else. That's, that's not for me. And, and so for those folks, you quickly learn and say, okay, we're not going to build you a passive house. We're going to build you a high performance home. And, and we're just building the same house, but just by a different name. So just a couple of general questions before we dig into the passive house. When you started going down this route of becoming a builder, is it just a natural process that you integrate with the designer? Is there much input for you or do you just do as you're told? (laughs) Oh, I believe it's crucial, you know, especially when you're doing in a high performance building such as a passive house, that all my my employees, the design team that's brought on, everybody be fully committed. Otherwise, it makes the task a lot harder. And it's a hard enough task to begin with. Uh, So what does that mean, though? Oh, well, actually, I mean, I'm just getting involved in a project right now where the homeowner was interested in building a passive house, but they had worked with an architect previously. And so they said, well, we really, really want to work with him. He's such a nice guy. We're, we have a good relationship, good rapport. And I said, okay, but I I have resources of many architects that you can speak to that, that I know you would really love. But uh, if you're truly committed to this guy, then I suggest at the very least and uh, bring me in, bring in a passive house mechanical engineer in early and we could try and steer him down the road and help guide him. But it actually became quite difficult for the client pushing the, his architect to make the changes that even the client knew that he needed to make. And so now he spent money on this architect and he's going to have to move in another direction now. And he's looking for new passive house trained architects. How do we find people that we know are going to be up to the task, uh, particularly tradespeople, but also, yeah, our main architects? I think at the very basics, the architect should be certified as a passive house uh, consultant. Bring, I, I mean, as many certified folks as you can get on there. So then you know that they've been trained and they're committed to passive house. So that's easier to find. Like when I got trained for passive house in 2010, there were 62 people in the class. I think there were three of us that were actual builders. The rest were, you know, architects and maybe one or two engineers. And so it is substantially easier to find architects than certified passive house consultant builders. In recent time, they've now brought on the the tradesperson standard. You could see that now the tradespeople have a way of uh, of getting trained. The training is not as deep as the consultancy training, but it is a way for tradespeople to start wrapping their heads around Passive House and showing their commitment. What we have done on our projects is created teams of folks 
through experience and relationships. And that's, I guess, the way it works all the time. I mean, I have certain architects that I love to work with. The folks that design the project that we're working on right now, River Architects, you know, they're just phenomenal. I mean, their whole office is fully committed to Passive House, and uh, it makes the process really much more of a, of a dream. When you first built to the Passive House standard, how was that experience? Oh, it's... Uh, you realize that the air barrier never goes on vacation. You know, we're not uh, doing um, X, Y, and Z portion of the job and not thinking about air barrier. Every day, every job you do, you're thinking about how is what I'm doing affecting my air barrier. And I've taken the approach of actually having one guy right on site, fully committed to the air barrier every day. Because, you know, a lot of a lot of folks, you know, you just do a job, you're framing, everything's happy-go-lucky, the building's going up super quick. But now if you have a detail where, let's say, like on, on our, our project where we're, we're coming up below ground from a basement situation and we have to make a transition with some fabric, you only get one opportunity to do that. And uh, you don't want to bury those opportunities inside the structure. And so everybody on your team and all your subs have to learn to work together. It's not just, uh, oh, the electrician's coming in and he's going to do his thing and then the plumber comes in and he's going to do his thing. Everybody has to work together because there's going to be times where the electrician is going to want to put a, a wire through the barrier and he's got to talk to the carpenters about, uh, you know, maybe we need to make a boot oh, don't drill all those wires and shove them through one hole because they'll be really difficult to air seal. Same thing with the plumber. So it's all about working harmoniously with each other. So I would say that's probably where where people see the modest increase in what would be the passive house premium in cost because it probably does take a little bit more time to coordinate. But as the tradespeople come more used to building this way, that that's going to diminish and disappear. Is it a little bit like Groundhog Day sometimes that when you've got new people on site, you're having to go through all of the same explanations and start back there? Can it be a little bit frustrating? Oh, you definitely need continuity. It's a huge advantage, obviously, because you don't want to uh, be in a situation where you're uh, having to uh, re-explain why the heck are we doing things so different <laughs> than everyone's so used to doing them. And I think when people come on and they do begin to understand what we're doing and why we're doing it, you see a total different level in workmanship because people are just so excited to be doing something that's uh, comfortable for, for the folks that are going to live in the house and and uh, my 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 workers, they take so much pride in the job. It's hard to get them into the truck to go home. They they stand <laughs> every day. Seriously, they, every day they stand out there and they take pictures of themselves at the house. A good old selfie. Yes, because yeah, they and they to show you know to just keep documenting the uh, the development. And it's that level of ownership that I think you need to feel in order to have success. Perhaps we could use one of your buildings as an example and you could explain how you become involved in a project and what you're responsible for from start to finish, what time span it would take. Just a really detailed idea of what a passive house builder does. We're working on a passive house right now, which will actually be New Jersey's first passive house and it will also be a home for me and my family uh, and I think the important thing to note is that a passive house doesn't have to be a cold sterile box let's design the house that's going to fit the client let's design the house that they want to live in because passive house most importantly is about comfort so comfort is thermal comfort, and comfort is loving the space that you're in. And I feel with the project that we're working on right now, it is a physical representation of how 
my family is going to live their lives in that house. And so that's number one when when putting a project together. Bring in your builder early. That is another key, key thing that I highly recommend uh, because when you bring in your builder, it's not just the architect just drawing up these plans in a vacuum and then dropping them on the builder's lap and then he walks away and the builder's there and no, Let's not do that. Let's bring in the builder. Let's talk. Let's everybody's getting on the same page so that we can um, have a project that limits the amount of change orders. It's designed exactly the way you want it, so it gets built exactly the way it's designed, and then there's no cost overruns. And that's, I think, a very, very important part of the process to bring everybody in early, including I, 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 I even bring in my subs in terms of uh you know plumber electric and uh and then if need be you know have the uh, passive house consultant for me that would be myself give a little presentation and and tips and techniques to those subs about what we're trying to accomplish here to have them get emotional buy-in on the process and what did you want from your house when you set about designing it, what were the key things? Because this is something that I'm going to go through and I'm still at the stage where I can change things. So what did you want? Well, I mean, just design-wise, we wanted to keep the uh, public spaces open and flowing. Uh, On the first floor, we just tried to make a a subtle division between the public and the semi-private spaces. Uh, There's also, I also love to cook. Me too. Yes. I, I, well, you should take a look at our floor plan because... What's your I've, favorite uh, meal? I, my favorite thing to do is to come home and my wife says, oh, there is absolutely nothing we got to order in. And then I look around and I just put the most crazy thing together and it's absolutely amazing if i may say so but (laughs) well that's the interesting point that we both had this kitchen that we're going to use so what have you decided about that to take you forward what's important in the kitchen well my biggest fear was in the kitchen that uh we would have a situation where i was searing something and it would get too smoky and smelly in the kitchen and the house would be too tight but when you have your ERV and you keep your ERV about 10 feet, the extraction, you keep that about 10 feet away from the range so it doesn't get the particulate, but it's going to be taking out all that smell and smoke and recapturing that heat energy that's in there. And then you have your hood, your recirculation hood over your range, which will catch the particulate. And if need be, we put a boost switch by the range to boost up the ERV for the time while you may be searing that fish. So I'm looking forward to searing and uh, <laughs> cooking and, and using my, using the induction range. Uh, uh, that was something I was going to ask you, actually, is do you have to be careful about heat gains in a passive house kitchen? Yes, you do. Uh, when you're using gas, I mean, a lot of the uh, heat doesn't just go into the pot that you're cooking and it goes all over the kitchen. But I would say even more of an issue is the fact that here in the U.S. you have a connection cost to the gas company and uh, most passive houses don't need any gas unless you want to have it for your range. And you're not going to use enough gas cooking on your range to justify the connection cost. So you're kind of just throwing money away if you have a gas range in a passive house. Got you. Are there any other things about your house that are going to be special or that you'd like to mention? So the primary thing, when I was, I was talking earlier about the comfort and the flow of the house, I mean, also with a passive house, you always want to design to the south, right? You want to have 20% of your glazing to the south and then 5% everywhere else. Uh, but that's ideal. In our case, we had great southern exposure, but our view is really to the north. So we we weren't afraid. We put as much glass as we felt we wanted, but uh, we knew we had to compensate in other areas. So our walls are a little thicker than probably most passive houses, and and our roof is probably a little thicker than most passive houses as well. 
Now, Darren, that's really interesting what you've said there, because I've had this question in on SpeakPipe from Alex. Let's take a listen. Uh, hi there. My name is Alex. I'm uh, leaving this message from the literally the centre of Ireland. Um, first of all, thanks very much for your website and podcasts. They, um, they've provided a lot of information over the, the last few weeks and months. Uh, myself and my wife are embarking on a self-build. Uh, we hope to go passive. And the question I have is related to the site that we have uh, found. The site has wonderful lake views to the north. The site is completely open. We've got full blue skies to the south and the east and west. So there's no issue with uh, solar gain in that direction. My question is, what do you do with a northern facing site when the views are there? Uh, I know you can put windows there, triple glazing, of course, if not quadruple. Um, my question, have you any uh, information or comments on what to do with a north facing site? So, Darren, what can we say to Alex? Is there any help or advice you can give him? Sure. I mean, when you're designing the house and you, you, you're you putting into PHBP, design the house that you want and then work your way and adjust within the PHBP because you could see as you're making those changes what you need to do, you know, if you have some big, beautiful windows. And we have a floor-to-ceiling intis window with French doors that go off the back. We have a gigantic lift and slide uh, on the north side and then another door and window on the north side as well. So we have a lot of glazing on our north and it's unabashed, you know, but we're still achieving the standard. You you got to rob Peter to pay Paul. So, you know, we have R45 walls and an R90 roof, just a little bit more insulation than a typical passive house. So it doesn't get you into problems. Say, for example, you want to use solar gain on the south then, but you can't afford to because you've got to have smaller window sizes on that side. Smaller window sizes on the south? To make up for the north, or am I not understanding that? No, no, you you, you still want to keep 20% of your glazing on the on the south side. You want to get that solar gain, that low winter sun coming in, and you want to make sure that you have enough shading on that south side. You treat that south side as, as you traditionally would, and then you try and limit what you have on the east and the west, and then you do all your views to the north if need be. And that was actually a very typical question that you get during the uh, even the passive house exam in the consultancy training. They would throw that out you, and you would have to design a house with the views to the north in 45 minutes. In other words, <laughs> this is solvable with design, if solvable is a word. <laughs> it it is it is and and like i was just saying the passive house consultants are trained to solve that problem it's not uh we want to make the house that fits you and then passive house is just on top of that it's not about trying to fit you into a passive house it's about fitting a passive house into your lifestyle Let's get back to your house for a moment. Has there been anything that you would do differently next time or lessons that you've learned? I would say one of the biggest lessons learned that I had on this particular project would be that when you're looking at the house that you want to build and you have the site and there's a house on it already, is this house... Uh, worth saving. In our situation, the house really wasn't worth saving and we knocked the house down, but then we, we worked with the existing basement. And uh, I think when all was said and done, it wasn't such a great choice to work with the existing basement. It, it created this funny air barrier detail because the actual building is larger than the existing basement. So we have this crawl space and it would have just been much easier either to eliminate the basement altogether or to make the basement fit underneath the building properly. So I think you have to seriously consider like what is worth saving or is it just best to just start new? Obviously, in New York City, there's all these gorgeous brownstones and you want to, you know, save those and make those more energy efficient or there's plenty of homes worth saving. But uh, when when in doubt, knock it down. It's going to be a lot easier. Some other lessons uh, learned is that the um, mechanical systems are so simple and small that uh, our carpenter team was able to install uh, the mini splits, the ducted mini splits, doing all the ducting and uh, the ERV 
these are these were great things that helped us keep our costs down and kept the project moving because we did them all in house and I was delighted to see how uh, well that worked out for us. Well, Darren, I've really enjoyed our chat today. Thank you very much for your time. And is there a final thought that you'd like to finish on? Hmm. Well, I would say we shouldn't accept being uncomfortable in our own homes anymore. Now that we know that there's a better way to build, we all must take it upon ourselves to build better because these buildings outlive us and they're really our legacy and it's our gift to our future. So let's be comfortable in the present and and give the world a better future by building better. Darren, thank you very much. My pleasure, Ben. Thank you so much. And what a great podcast. Thanks for having me on. Every time I do an interview, I learn something and hopefully you do too. If you'd like to review any of the information that we've talked about in our conversation today, then you can check out the show notes. They're online this session, houseplanninghelp.com slash 90. We have scan friendly headlines. So if you don't want to go into depth, you can just go down the page really quickly or go into more depth or download the transcript, whatever you fancy. We've got some photos on there of Darren's house, links to him to Blue Nest, sorry, Blue Nest. And there's a section at the bottom where you can make a comment. Houseplanninghelp.com slash 90. My call to action today is to go and check out the Regen Media website. Ta-da! It's online, glossy. We've tried to focus it more in on what we do. We're all about video and audio, so we've used video and audio to sell our website. We're also mobile ready as well, so if you come from an iOS device or whatever it may be, it's going to look really good now. We're very targeted. For a while, we just did anything, and I wasn't comfortable with that, particularly doing house planning help all about construction of really high-quality houses. So that's what we do as a production company. We've narrowed it down. Some people would say we're crazy. We say this is what we love to do. So it's all about construction. If you're a company who's trying to better things, to make energy-efficient buildings or renewable energy or whatever is going to push things forward into this sustainable economy, those growing areas, then we want to work with you. Regenmedia.co.uk. And I'm also going to do a shout out to John Buskell and the team at Moondog Marketing. I would thoroughly recommend them and we'll link them into the show notes as well. Finally, we have a sponsor for this podcast. And I hear it's a very good company. It's called Regen Media. So at the end of each podcast, I'm just going to remind you of that fact. So we're pretty much done for today. All that remains for me is to say that next time my guest is Thomas O'Leary from the Passive House Academy. And we're going to talk about why he became an early adopter of Passive House and what he's learnt over the years. He really travels the world too. So he's going to have lots of information there. He's been involved in retrofits. I can't wait to have a chat with him. I mean, he's, he's an all round great guy. The House Planning Help podcast is produced by Regen Media. Content that matters.